we'll, we'll wait another minute or two uh, to begin, as we often do. Good afternoon. Um, I, this is Siegler speaking. I'm delighted to welcome you uh, to the spring quarter lecture series um, on ethics in the COVID-19 pandemic, medical, social, and political issues. Um, we will have seven, the final seven lectures will be this quarter uh, beginning today. Um, and that, that will give us a total of 27 lectures uh, dur during the academic year. Um, I'm very excited about today's uh, lecture, which will be on medical education during the COVID-19 pandemic. We have three extraordinary speakers, uh, Jeannie Farnan and Anita Blanchard and Vinnie Aurora. Um, let me begin by uh, briefly introducing uh, Dr. Farnan. As Associate Dean for Evaluation and Continuous Quality Improvement, and is also an experienced qualitative researcher here at the university, uh, Jeannie Farnan has focused her career on research and scholarship in health professions education, curriculum development, and evaluation. Dr. Farnan's work has already resulted in more than 100 peer-reviewed publications, including several book chapters and numerous invited speaking presentations on assessment, curricular design, and evaluation. Jeannie currently serves on the AAMC Curriculum Inventory Research Group, the Central Group on Educational Affairs, and the AAMC Research in Medical Education Leadership Group. Dr. Farnan graduated here from the Pritzker School of Medicine and completed her internship residency and fellowship in hospital medicine, also here at the University of Chicago and received her master's in health professions education at the University of Illinois at Chicago. It is a pleasure to welcome Dr. Jean Farnan as our first speaker today, Jean. Thank you, Dr. Siegler. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with everyone here. So let's go ahead and do this. Uh, hopefully you can all see my slides. So I'm really excited to start off, I think, what will be a very interesting conversation uh, with these wonderful panelists to talk about the experience along the medical education continuum during the COVID-19 pandemic. I will be primarily focusing on the changes and issues related to undergraduate medical education uh, in the time of COVID-19. So just to give you an idea about where I'd like to go for the next 20 or so minutes uh, is really to review the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on undergraduate medical education, so medical school, uh, specifically preclinical education, uh, the impact on the clinical training of our medical students, and really the impact on the ability to do career exploration during their time in medical school. Talk about the ethical dilemmas that were really posed uh, to the leadership of the school by the COVID-19 pandemic and think about how the uh, implications of the pandemic will be felt in medical education from here and then moving forward uh, as, we, as we sort of move into our post-COVID world. Uh, I have no relevant financial disclosures uh, to reveal. Uh, 
So I will take you all back in a timeline and I'll talk more specifically about the Pritzker response to the pandemic, but also try to give you the global uh, view of what medical education, at least UME, was across the country during these last uh, 13 months. So if you think back to March 11th of 2020, which actually feels like it was almost yesterday, even though it was roughly 389 days ago, uh, we received the first statement from the AAMC, the Association of American Medical Colleges on COVID-19, which primarily focused on testing availability, the availability of personal protective equipment, uh, and the use of telehealth. As I'm sure you all recall, during this time frame was when we were really seeing uh, changes in New York City as it became the sort of epicenter of the pandemic and the, the first sort of days of how things were unfolding. The first major decision point had to happen for medical education across the country um, near the middle of March, and for us it was March 13th. Uh, to give you a little bit of context, at that point in time, the third year medical students, who were the clinical clerks, were on their rotations and would have been finishing roughly at the end of that week, March 17th, uh, to take their final exams and then to leave campus for their spring break holiday. Um, same thing with our preclinical medical students who were in their M1 and M2 coursework. Uh, their final exams were planned for the end of that week to depart for spring break for a week. The fourth year students are on a monthly schedule and so ordinarily participate in month-based clinical and non-clinical electives. So for the one to 30 days of uh, the month or one to 31 for March. Um, on March 13th, uh, the decision was made with the leadership of the Pritzker School of Medicine to um, to remove our students from the clinical wards at that time. And several factors went into that decision. Um, it had been and actually preceded the recommendations of the AAMC to suspend clinical activities for students. And we made that decision for several reasons. Um, I'll talk about the conceptual framework with which we approached all of our decision making, but really it boiled down to three issues. One, student safety, um, and that was relative to the availability of testing, the availability of PPE, uh, the quality of the educational experience, and then, of course, the timing of the educational experience. Um, if you think back to a year ago, it seems amazing that we already have several viable treatment options, multiple vaccination options, um, but you know, March 13th of 2020, there was a lot of fear and concern and a real lack of understanding about COVID-19, um, the impact of coronavirus, and, and really what it meant. And so in order to um, make sure our students were safe, in order to recognize, and I'm sure Dr. Blanchard will acknowledge, the stress and anxiety and the level of response that was required from the GME community here, we removed the students from the wards at that time. They were given an additional two study days uh, prior to their shelf exams and took their exams in the normal schedule. That Friday, the AAMC released their first of several major statements in which they provided what they titled Guidance on Medical Student Clinical Rotations. Um, because epidemiologically the country was in very different places at that time, recommendations were made to schools about the continuation of clinical activity based upon the following things. Whether or not students had sufficient access to PPE, um, whether or not there was reasonable testing and turnaround time, and they, they addressed uh, something that we thought was very interesting, which was ensuring that students were um, providing voluntary services to aid healthcare workers. Um, around this time was when I'm sure you all recall, there were conversations happening primarily in New York City about the early graduation of medical students um, and moving students sort of quickly into the healthcare worker role. Many other schools, especially in New York, but also in Chicago and some on the West Coast, had many of their students um, really mobilizing uh, different voluntary service opportunities to help healthcare workers doing grocery shopping, uh, pet sitting, you know, child sitting, that sort of thing. And so in an effort to ensure that there was not any student mistreatment, uh, the AAMC statement really stressed the voluntary service uh, to provide um, a service to healthcare workers. April 2020, the university suspends all in-person learning, and at that point, it required a major pedagogical shift for us uh, as the medical school. Uh, our students had left for spring break, and at that point in time, we transitioned almost overnight to a fully remote online teaching experience with the help and assistance of uh, the university's tech, um, which I, I can't say enough about the uh, nimble and rapid way in which uh, technology was completely changed in order to provide a robust educational experience to the students. In May of 2020, as we began to sort of really start to understand and, and have a vision about what the future might look like, uh, the Coalition for Accountability made some very important statements. 
the coalition is actually a group that's made up of several organizations, lay individuals, learners across the continuum, um, which includes the AAMC, which is the Association of American Medical Colleges, the ACGME, the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education, as well as the National Board of Medical Examiners, the American Medical Association, and other um, accrediting organizations like the LCME. Uh, they made a major statement about what the plan would be for the career exploration and application process and timeline for fourth year medical students in allopathic and osteopathic schools across the country. Uh, the most, and I think the most significant statement that they made was the suspension of all in-person away rotations for academic years 20 to 21. Um, many subspecialties and a rising number of surgical subspecialties require that students do audition rotations or away rotations at other institutions to obtain a letter for their application, and these were suspended uh, in the beginning of May. In addition, there was a suspension of in-person residency interviews uh, for the application cycle for AY 2021, and a delay in the opening of uh, ERAS, which is the Electronic Residency Application System, until October, uh, because several students across the country were delayed in their completion of their clinical clerkships. The AAMC did respond relatively rapidly to the, the pandemic and did set up a medical education senior leaders uh, call that happened on a roughly every other week basis, but also started to dashboard um, the changes that were happening across the country. I'll show you several of those now, um, but really got to uh, provide some national benchmarking and responses to the pandemic across the country, specifically transitions in the pedagogical approach to preclinical curricula, the ability of students to see patients during the pandemic, who was allowing students to see COVID patients, availability of PPE, and as we move forward into this most recent year, vaccination status for students. So like I said, as we thought about how we made each of these decisions, uh, we stood up our own sort of Hicks uh, group, which was a curriculum executive committee that really helped to make a lot of these decisions relatively rapidly um, in real time uh, as things were changing on a nearly daily basis. Um, our three sort of tenets that we approached things with were to ensure student personal safety. Um, that included making sure students had adequacy of PPE, that there was adequacy of testing, and that advocacy and service opportunities were voluntary, um, and that students really could participate to the level with which they felt was within their own degree of personal safety. Obviously, the quality of their medical education was significantly important. Again, one of the things that really impacted our ability to, or our decision to take the students off the wards was the additional stressors that were being felt by the GME community at that time. And so we wanted to make sure students were having a quality experience. Um, we obviously turned to our accrediting bodies, the LCME, for guidelines about clinical experiences. The LCME requires that no more than 25% of your clinical experience on any rotation can be simulated, meaning um, an online case or a, or, a, um, or a discussion about a diagnosis. So we really had to work with our clerkship directors to make sure that students were getting an adequate exposure through telemedicine and other simulation strategies. Um, and we actually were able to find pretty creative telehealth options for students to continue a lot of their clinical work during this time frame. And finally, timing of medical education. We really prioritized the graduation of the 2020 uh, School of Medicine students. Uh, they were in the March of their fourth year, um, and they had you know, three months left ahead of them to graduate. We really wanted to make sure that we were having them graduate on a timely, um, on, a on their timeline, but then also making curricular changes in order to ensure that the students coming behind them were gonna have a robust experience, but also not have their medical education extended. So what were the big catastrophes? Uh, so there were a handful of catastrophes. Uh, the first was the response globally and nationally to the USMLE and to the MCAT. Um, our students take the USMLE Step 1 exam, which is a United States Medical Licensing Examination, the first of three exams uh, that they usually, uh, after they finish their second year in March of their of their second chronologic year of school. They have a study block for six weeks and then they usually take the exam in May of their second year. This is not unusual and across the country, it really was regardless of your curricular structure, um, the response of the, the NBME and the USMLE was, was challenging. The Prometric testing centers which offer these exams were not deemed essential and so were closed during the pandemic. Students were having random cancellations of their tests 12 hours before. The AAMC which, uh, which offers the medical College uh, admissions test um, made some uh, 
questionable decisions at the very beginning of the pandemic, offering exams that ran you know, into midnight uh, for some students. And so the standardized testing environment in UME was very fraught with a lot of challenges during the pandemic. It had a significant impact on student well-being and tr tremendous anxiety, and really was an opportunity cost to, to education during that time frame, with students sort of in this purgatory of step prep, um, not knowing when they would be able to take their exam. All of the accreditation um, uh, bodies, and Dr. Blanchard will speak about the ACGME, but for us specifically, the LCME transitioned relatively rapidly to a virtual environment, a uh, completely unknown animal for all of us in UME. And so we were preparing for our accreditation visit during this time of the pandemic. And so not only were we kind of keeping the curriculum going at the same time, we were also preparing for our accreditation visit in October of 2020. Um, not all schools were adhering to certain guidelines in the way that they were suggested by the AAMC, and I foresee that will continue to be a challenge as we move forward into this year as the coalition has made additional recommendations about changes to away rotations for AY 21-22. Specifically, COPA, the Coalition for Physician Accountability, has recommended that students only do one away rotation um, at a, an extramural site, and that is to be monitored and policed by the schools themselves. Um, the adherence to these guidelines seems to be um, relatively different based on the, the school, and so uh, we're going to have to work with those guidelines and, and work with our students to, to ensure that we have positioned them as, as best as possible for their match. And then I don't know that I would necessarily say the match was a catastrophe, but I put a plus minus here because there were a handful of very, um, I think, troubling things that happened this year, specifically uh, some com computer and technology problems around the SOAP, which is a supplemental offering of um, unfilled positions, previously referred to as the scramble. Um, so this was, I think, really very challenging for students. Uh, there were a number of um, unfilled or unmatched students uh, nationally and a large cry about re-examining the positions and spots. Um, Dr. Blanchard and Dr. Aurora may speak more about this, um, but I, I definitely think that we are coming to a point in, in medical education where we will be talking about how we advise students specifically and really what the global needs of the community, uh, medical community of this country are relative to the spots that are available for students. But what were the big wins? The technology transition was absolutely amazing on all fronts. Uh, the university, I think, really did an amazing job and were very thoughtful in providing all of the schools with the technological resources, purchasing things, you know, sort of at the very upfront time of the pandemic so that we weren't waiting for monitors and computers. And so really we're very um, proactive in that planning. Um, the revisit for the um, admitted students um, to the Pritzker School of Medicine, which is uh, organized by Dr. Kemi Carter, who's our Associate Dean for Admissions, was absolutely phenomenal. The virtual revisit process was probably one of the best in the country. And I think that really allowed us to to recruit an amazing class of 2024. Um, Dr. Weiwei Lee, uh, with other colleagues, including Dr. Jim Woodruff, uh, did some student support surveys to look at our students' response and how they felt they were supported during the pandemic um, compared to some peers that, the, that they surveyed. Our students really did feel that they were communicated with during the pandemic, that we were making changes with their, um, with their input. And we had weekly, you know, all school Zooms for the first several months of the pandemic really to make sure and to touch base with students. Dr. Lee also ran some Zoom wellness sessions that were incredibly well received. The National Board of Medical Examiners actually responded incredibly well, started a working group almost immediately, which resulted in two major changes. One was the remote offering of the shelf examinations for the clerkships, which was an incredible change, and two site-based offerings of the USMLE exam. We were actually able to offer step one on site and step two CK on site with the help of the MBME. Our Pritzker Health students, our COVID electives, in-person anatomy, we were one of the few schools in the country that actually allowed in-person anatomy. All of these huge wins. And obviously, the ability to have all of our students vaccinated by this point in time in the pandemic is another huge win. Just to show you a handful of photos, these are some of the dashboards. This is as of uh, March 23rd, just to get you an idea of where people are, their learning experiences being held virtually, lecture still largely being held virtually across the country, many students returning to face-to-face -face clinical activities. So really seeing these changes start to happen now as the pandemic is hopefully coming to maybe a nadir. We obviously will have to revisit that given the recent data. 
changes in clerkship duration, I think, is going to impact future decision-making regarding careers. Um, you see many of the uh, schools across the country have shortened clerkships to accommodate a COVID-impacted time frame. And of course, vaccination rollout. Um, many schools have not yet vaccinated their preclinical students. Uh, we thankfully are in a state that includes medical students as healthcare workers, and so we've been able to vaccinate all of our students. Um, many schools still offering students the ability to opt out of seeing COVID patients um, and have really left it to the students' discretion and their comfort. Future implications, like I said, I think this may be the death of lecture. Uh, I think we may see uh, a movement toward using instructional strategies that leverage these remote technologies. I think we're going to see, I think, a huge impact in curricular changes in terms of clinical preparedness of students, how they make their career choices and their research choices. And I think we may see some large-scale systemic changes to recruitment, both for the pre matriculants for medical school and the match. Just want to acknowledge all these folks, especially uh, Krista Carell and Dr. Stephen Weber on the Hicks team, who really made sure to keep the medical students at the table and all the decision-making, um, and of course, the students for their flexibility. Hand it back to Dr. Siegler uh, to introduce Dr. Blanchard. Dr. Dr. Fon, thank you so much, Dr. Fonin. It's a wonderful talk. Um, and what what we're going to do is hold off on asking questions, but please don't hold off on writing chat questions or Q and A questions, um, which Dr. Callender will organize uh, at the conclusion of the lecture. It's now a delight to introduce uh, Anita Blanchard. Um, who received her MD uh, from the U of C in 1990, is a professor of obstetrics and gynecology here at the university, and serves also as the associate uh, dean for graduate medical education at the Pritzker School, uh, a, a role in which she supervises and supports, believe it or not, 126 residency and fellowship programs that include 986 residents and fellows. Uh, Anita maintains accreditation standards, promotes professional development, and fosters strategic initiatives and innovation in medical education. Dr. Blanchard is committed to enhancing Chicago's South Side community by increasing the diversity of physicians and by building programs to fulfill community needs. Um, Dr. Blanchard has created innovative community programs, including seminars highlighting, highlighting maternal and adolescent topics. Uh, she also founded the Graduate Medical Education Resilience Initiative focused on maintaining physician well-being. Together with the Urban Health Initiative, Initiative team, Dr. Blanchard's Graduate Medical Education team launched a new program called Community Champions, facilitating resident and fellow participation in community engagement. And they did that in the winter of 2021. I could go on and on about uh, Dr. Blanchard as a practicing gynecologist and her specializations. She's a member of the board of directors for the American Board of Obstetrics and Gynecology, a member of the Accreditation Council, the Graduate Medical Education of the ob Review Committee, and it keeps going. But I'm delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Anita Blanchard as our second speaker today. Dr. Blanchard. Thank you, Dr. Siegler. I'm actually in an old part of the hospital and lying in, and it says that my internet is unstable. So if you can hear me and see my slides, I'm gonna turn off the video if that's okay. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the video because that may help a bit. And please interrupt me if, um, you know, the internet gets shaky. I, I intentionally stayed in the office after clinic thinking internet would be better, but who, who knows these days. So uh, I, I want to thank you all for inviting me here to talk about graduate medical education during COVID-19 pandemic. We certainly don't have all the answers and I feel like we're still working on solutions, but luckily we have a really amazing team of program directors, residents, fellows, faculty and coordinators uh, who are helping us in this process. So, um, 
So I'm going to talk a bit about the challenges in graduate medical education that are ongoing, how we've evolved to come up with some solutions and some potential long-term long ramifications related to our spot response, in addition to a new normal. And this will really be a conversation because as, as I mentioned, it's a work in progress and we're all you know, struggling to um, find the right path forward. Really, I think um, it was great to um, speak after Jeannie because she did a wonderful job highlighting all the issues. And I think many of the issues that were relevant and pertinent to the students certainly also apply to the residents, faculty and staff. But I would say really our greatest challenge was addressing fear of the unknown. So we all watched and waited as we saw things evolve across the world. Uh, we saw what happened in Wuhan, Italy, uh, watched the state of Washington and in New York. So part of it was wondering and watchful waiting. And in some ways, I think that time that we had gave us some opportunity for preparation. So some of the challenges that our colleagues faced around the world, we just had more time and preparation. So that helped a lot. Uh, of course, our residents and fellows in many of the programs were frontline workers. Um, so I'll talk a little bit later about the options for voluntary involvement versus, um, you know, compensatory involvement. And that really depended on um, their programs, their prior training, and some decision making on the part of their chairs and program leaders. Uh, really, there was a lot of fear, not only for patients and our ability to take care of them adequately with the adequate supplies, including, um, you know, ventilators and respiratory support, but also being able to triage patients, worrying about overloads to the system. Obviously, people were worried about themselves as well, physical and mental health. Uh, fortunately for us, we never had to deal with the lack of PPE. And as Jeannie clearly stated, I think Krista and Stephen were really wonderful through the process because communication and really addressing people's fears, I think, was really the key for everyone being able to successfully move through this. Obviously, people are also really afraid for their families and whether or not, you know, in their exposure, would they then be creating additional risk for their families? So fortunately, we were able to work with the teams, including Marco, um, to provide alternative housing arrangements for residents and fellows if they had significant exposure or if, you know, they were having some uh, symptoms. So these were all concerns that we really had to work through there was no playbook to tell us how to address these things. So we really tried to face things head on, answer questions as they arose, and make sure that people felt like even if we didn't know the answer, we were working toward a solution and with communication. Anita, can you hear us? is related to the pandemic. There was stage one, which is business as usual, in which there were no changes related to the common program. I, I, Anita, we're, we're, not, we're not hearing So we you. could talk amongst ourselves. And when I say we, they... Anita, we're not hearing you any longer. Should we? Hmm. I'm, I'm, Brian, I'm wondering if you should send her an email 
And if, if I should introduce Vinnie Aurora, um, and then we'll go back to, um, uh, to, to Anita. Yeah, we, we, we can try. Uh, oh, there she's. Can, can, can you hear us, Anita? Anita, you're on mute. If you're trying to talk to us, you're on mute right now. Or it's possible Yolanda could advance the slides. Right, I was suggesting we send Anita the phone number to call in and we can advance it. Yolanda can advance the slides. Yes. Yeah, I can pull up the slides. Uh, Dr. Flanchard, if you just wanna uh, look at your email, then I'll pull up the slides for you. Yolanda, you sent her a way to call in. Sorry, it's hard to unmute when I'm on the uh, share screen, but yes. Yeah, maybe, maybe while we're we're waiting to try to this get this settled, should we just have Vinny go? I'm I'm thinking that we perhaps we should. Uh, could could somebody send uh, Anita a, a note saying that we're having difficulty hearing? Yeah, I, I emailed her and I'll um, be in touch over email. Well, well, why so don't we go can do that? Uh, Vinny, uh, Vinny, can you hear me? Are, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Let, let me just say a quick word about Dr. Vinny Aurora. Um, who is the Herbert Abelson Professor of Medicine at the University of Chicago. Um, some of us remember Herb Abelson, who had been the chair of pediatrics at the University of Washington before coming to the University of Chicago, oh, in the early 1990s, I think, and was chair of pediatrics here. He was fantastic. So Vinny is the Herbert Abelson Professor oh. Um, as Associate Chief Medical Officer for the Clinical Learning Environment, um, Vinny bridges education and clinical leadership to engage trainees and staff in the institutional quality, safety, and value missions. Um, Vinny is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine, uh, whose work uh, is improving care and learning and teaching hospitals. and and Vinny has been funded by the NIH, the AHRQ, the, P the Macy Foundation. And I'm stunned that her work has been cited over 10,000 times. So someday I will get close to that, but not for a long time. Uh, Dr. Aurora um, has an academic focus in improving the learning environment for medical trainees and the quality, safety, and experience of care delivered to hospitalized adults. She works to ensure residents and fellows are integrated into hospital quality, safety, and value initiatives. It's an honor to introduce you to Dr. Vinit Aurora. Vinit. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna first start out by thanking everybody for having me here. And I also do wanna disclose that my office is in the same part of the hospital as Anita's. And so I also am right here down the hall. And so um, so if anything happens, uh, we'll be there together in the, in the ether of the internet. Um, so I'm gonna try to share my screen right now. 
Okay, so um, I'm going to be talking about some of the work um, that we've done on clinical learning. And so, as Jeannie's talked about UME, as we're going to hear more from Anita about GME, um, I was really thinking about more from the learning needs of everybody during the pandemic, which is the role that I play in our organization, and particularly at the point of care, which um, you can imagine the amount of information that we are still learning around um, COVID. COVID and vaccination is um, is really um, just overwhelming. Um, I want to start out by talking about trust and transparency for organizations and individuals. And I think um, you'll see why trust is so important and some of those principles have come through nicely in um, Jeannie's presentation and um, have already started to simmer through um, Anita's presentation, as well as how we are salvaging interprofessional teaming during the pandemic. So thinking about health professions as a whole, not just uh, medicine, and then share how our students in particular played value-added roles during the pandemic. You've heard some of Jeannie describe some of this already. Um, some of you may not know that the we are part of the AMA consortium, and actually the AMA also funds the Community Champions Program that Dr. Blanchard and GME leads. And so we've been uh, privy to this consortium where our, um, our philosophy around value-added roles has come through. So first, a little bit about trust. And so this is pioneering work from Amy Edmondson, who's a psychologist who presented at AAMC several years ago. Um, if you haven't read this work, it's really seminal. Um, it really talks about the difference between trust and psychological safety. And so trust is, do you give others the benefit of the doubt when you take a risk? And so do you feel like, you know, somebody, do you trust that you can speak up? Um, and I uh, highlighted that this has been so important during the pandemic, even think of you about the beginning of the pandemic to Dr. Li Wenling from Wuhan, who's the ophthalmologist who highlighted that he's seeing these um, novel SARS cases and what do we do. Um, to psychological safety. And this is, will others give you the benefit of the doubt when you get when you take a risk? And so, um, especially for our students, the most junior learners on the team, for our patients, this is a really important construct. Um, and I know that um, something that um, when we think about doctor-patient communication, obviously a core um, uh, you know, topic near and dear to Mark's heart and some of you on the call, I do see Monica on the call. Um, when we think about this, these are the same things for learners and for clinicians in our audience. And so do you trust that you can speak up in your organization is a big deal. Now, that actually relates to how organizational culture mediates that trust. And so we have very different organizational cultures all in healthcare, but also across healthcare and across nations. And so um, on one side, you can have a pathologic culture where information is hidden and messengers are shot, responsibilities are shirked, nobody wants to bridge, failure is covered up and new ideas are crushed. We know that in order to be a learning healthcare system, which the national academies and everyone's moving us towards, we need to learn um, from our failures. Information is actively sought, messengers are trained, responsibilities are shared, bridging is rewarded, and failure causes inquiry and new ideas are welcomed. And I will say that during the pandemic, I believe that organizations that had this generative culture um, that many of us are trying to cultivate are the ones that prevail. Um, the bureaucratic is in the middle, and that's where you're going to see, um, you know, how how does this play out? And so I did want to give you an example. Um, Brian had asked me to think a little bit about PPE, give, given the issues around um, personal professional responsibility of clinicians to care for patients, as well as personal fear that you started to hear about um, with, with yeah, PPE. So this is from the National Health Service of the UK, um, from BBC. Doctors told not to discuss PPE shortages and actually in a memo, avoid commenting on political issues such as PPE. Suggested tweets to thank the staff paying tribute for retire, retiring um, staff coming in and retweet us, retweet the NHS. And so I just wanted to highlight that's a very different culture. And that's certainly if that if this was the type of memo that I think any American hospital put out would not be well received. Um, and many of you recall that people were taking to social media to highlight the issues of PPE. And fortunately, um, as you already heard, University of Chicago had some great, um, you know, supplies of PPE, but this was still a fear. People still had fear. 
Um, how do we improve trust and transparency? Well, this is something that I've been working on with Stephen Weber for a long time in the clinical excellence in the CMO office, and we really focused on ease of practice. And so how do we allow our clinicians, our uh, physicians, advanced practice providers, nurses, and others to submit ideas, to tell us, to be the, the messenger, to tell us things aren't working. And so we created this What to Fix program uh, where we get, you know, over, we've gotten over uh, hundreds of ideas, one-stop shop to submit ideas. And it was patterned after this really stupid stuff. This was actually the title in the New England Journal of Medicine program uh, profiled from um, Ashton, Melinda Ashton in Hawaii, that was also the winner of the ABIM Trust Practice Challenge. So a way for organizations to build trust with a frontline. Serves as a way to encourage communication about issues. And it's a way for an organization to learn what needs to be fixed. And I remember during the pandemic, right when things got really scary. Um, we were getting tons of what to fixes from the emergency room um, about because it was the easiest way to tell somebody the hand sanitizer is out, please come help. You know, and we were communicating with various teams about scrubs and this and that. And so, um, so just to give you a sense of like what it was like at that time. So just the context for what was going on at the University of Chicago Medicine, well, certainly clinicians, the immediate need was clinicians physically distancing from in inpatients and each other, um, and as well as um, pulling back on telemedicine for everyone else. The Hicks um, began, the team began messaging on updated policies multiple times a day, and often with vital information like that PPE education. And what we were told is, I, I will never forget a senior surgeon calling me and saying, I am concerned. I do not know how to don and doff. Um, and multiple people saying this is challenging to learn. And, and some of it was because it was on the hospital internet and it was video and it wasn't at the point of care. There was a lot of information anxiety. Around the same time, um, as you'll remember, um, the hospital had made the decision to trans, uh, to um, you know, change over general medicine and med surge units into COVID units, and this is actually was a positive thing that was um, something that was um, highlighted as a way to actually concentrate risk of exposures, um, PPE use in a few staff, but it also increased um, concern of burnout, and so that was a pro and a con. What I will say, what I noticed the most is the demand for learning to care for those patients in those units where you often felt alone um, and didn't have a lot of the students were already pulled back there weren't a lot of people visiting um, exponentially increased and so what were some of the innovations that we could actually um, you know uh, throw uh, throw out to kind of think about this and this is actually um, the you know the medicine residency actually staffed a COVID unit and interestingly in a recent journal of hospital medicine article um, it was uncommon for residents to staff COVID units and so this was this is a pretty unique um, feature of our organization where we did have residents who were staffing a COVID unit. So first, let's go back to the PPE example. Well, you know, PPE, how do people learn about PPE? I know this sounds crazy, but the fundamental way, the point of care is the signage. And so uh, working with um, uh, Craig Umshied, Rachel Mars, Sharon Markman, who was serving as a PPE observer, along with our medical students who were redeployed to serve as PPE observers because in early studies had shown that if you had sort of a, a buddy system, somebody to check that your PPE was on correct, you actually felt better and you did better. Um, these were the original signs. Working with patient experience and health literacy, patient education, we um, changed the signs to be more of a checklist. And so you could lock down, use visual graphics, and you might be wondering, well, why would we work with patient health literacy, patient education? Well, so it turns out the same principle principles that apply to patient education, which is keep it simple, visual, you know, checklist, apply to clinicians too. It's not like clinicians are any different. Information overload is still an issue there. And then working with IDEO, a design company, um, you know, to think about, well, what, how do these signs, uh, you know, can be, they be modified to be even more, um, you know, design oriented to get across the issues. Now, one thing that we found was that not, we have, we're looking at a study, we did a survey of clinicians to find out what they thought about these signs, not all signage has the same effect. So these signs differ in their in how trustworthy they are and how informative the sign is. And there were specific role differences where physicians preferred some signs and nurses preferred other signs. And so um, I will leave it at that and say that you know work is ongoing, but just to say not all education and signage and the way we learn is different.
The next thing that happened is that uh, one of our um, attendings said, you know, there's no way that I'm going to be able to, uh, you know, I'm on telemedicine. How am I going to keep up with the Hicks email every day? And so is there a way that we can get this at point of care through our apps? And so um, we actually were fortunate that we had a um, cardiology fellow who's now a, attending at Penn, um, who was in the informatics program, who actually had already deployed an app to help with calling um, five digit numbers in the hospital. And so we partnered with him and thought, well, could we actually put in protocols? Um, could we put in the PPE instructions? And the key thing from an ethical standpoint is you don't want to put in too much because it's going to keep uh, the minute it, it reminded me of the work around communication failures and sign out. The minute you transcribe something, it's out of date. So you have to go and look to see what was happening. And so the last thing you would want from an organization is to have version control problems. And so there was a lot of discussion about how do we keep it light? How do we make sure that people are using it well? And so, um, so we actually did um, have data then on how people used it. And one thing that's interesting is you can see here early in the pandemic, that very first hump in red is people accessing those PPE instructions and the policy content. And then this is a big spike in July when we welcomed new clinicians, new interns predominantly to our organization, but also new uh, pharmacy residents and nurses, et cetera. And you can see at that time, there was a lot of more, um, you know, demand on, you know, how do I call somebody? How do I call the charge nurse? Um, and so you can see here that people are gathering information from different sources. Back to the COVID unit and care for COVID patients. Um, so um, many of our COVID units were staffed by residents, hospitalists, anesthesia, a variety of individuals. We um, we also had librarians. And so we've uh, actually talked about, we have medical librarians who actually were supporting five services at the time and in person on rounds um, in a variety of different ways. And obviously with um, social distancing, we pulled that back to be virtual. And but we were like, ah, how, you know, how do we do that? At the same time, we also had students, fourth years, that were pulled back. And so we thought, well, let's actually work with fourth year medical student volunteers. We'll create an elective. And actually, we ran this for over six months. Um, and we're going to answer COVID questions that anybody comes up with. Um, and this was work done with Deb Werner, Caitlin Van Campen, as well as Maggie Collison, who's an ID um, fellow in hospital epidemiology and now junior uh, attending. And so the, um, the, uh, the, the idea here was just get point of care questions. And so how do you accelerate that learning because it's happening so fast? Um, and what I want to highlight is that when we went live with this service, the first questions that we got were not about patients. They were about personal safety. So back to the point that Anita mentioned, it was about how do I keep myself safe? How do I keep family safe? And so, um, you know, um, this is just a survey showing that, um, you know, 90 questions were answered, 325 articles summarized. Uh, many of the clinicians thought it was helpful in uh, practice, as well as informing some of the research. The team also supported a conference that was actually a joint conference with Wuhan, as you know, our ID uh community and our medical school has a partnership with Wuhan through Renslow Sharer. And so um, that's been really interesting to see some of those questions as well. And then what about teaming? And so I would say, you know, this gets back to rounding. So how do we really uh, learn together, you know, with attendings and, you know, um, residents and nurses at the bedside and, and, and hospitals? Like initially the rounding scheme had to change. Uh, we had done a lot of work through our Ignite program, improving GME nursing interprofessional team experiences, which is a partnership between GME, nursing, clinical excellence, um, and others to actually um, bring together physicians and nurses to do the these touch bases and they touch bases completely fell apart um, at the beginning of the pandemic because the last thing you would want to do is actually see somebody um, because you were trying to just kind of get your work done and get out of there. And it, um, this is important. How does it relate to trust? Nurses are the most trusted group at 19 years in a row. Doctors in the Gallup poll this year have increased to number two, which is exciting, uh, but still not as trusted as nurses. Um, and improving teamwork was pretty important to salvage. This was a salvage operation uh, because in July, when we were welcoming new interns, you know, it was going to be harder to recognize people with PPE. Larger teams were still not rounding. There was still social distancing. So we deployed this MD APP in the room button uh, to touch base on patients. And so in every room in the CCD, you can press the MD 
MD in the room button, it alerts to the nurse phone, the nurse phone and the nurses are told, try to do a touch base. You can do the touch base in the hallway. You don't need to go in the room just to get the plan of care. And I don't need to explain to you guys with hospital capacity and with literally us uh, uh, on a surge day today, every day, um, these are the types of conversations that help um, accelerate both learning and discharge since a lot of times the nurses have valuable information that we might not have. I'm pleased to report that uh, this actually has translated into some great findings around uh, patient ratings of team works well together. So this is from our dashboard and we see here that in the most recent data in March, we've got um, you know, um, most of our units are in the green, only three units in the red, but you can compare that to early in the pandemic where you see a lot more red. And so on this heat map, you definitely see we are moving towards kind of our patients recognizing that we are working together again. Um, so what about learning? And so uh, this goes back to um, the, you know, rounding. And so how do we round together? How do medical students round and get that experience? Well, this is work that was pioneered by Nikki Orlov and Chris Matson and the pediatric Ignite team side. And they already have this great culture of family-centered rounding, where families, uh, in this case, uh, mom comes outside the door, um, and then you've got the nurse. They have they've perfected this system where the nurse joins rounds, and then the attending was on rounds. And before it was like 20 people on this in this circle, because you know how can you have that happen when you have social distancing? And so now, if you see this, there's actually an iPad mounted here on an IV pole, and I and then there's a speaker. And you may think this sounds Sounds, you know, uh, you know, easy to do. I will tell you that Nikki spent, Nikki, Chris, and the team spent weeks trying to figure out how to do this, like which uh, design theory, you know, similar to those PPE signs, reiterative PDSA cycles to be like, how do you get the iPad? And they they can actually tell you which clip to purchase, um, as well as um, the, um, the which speaker is best. Now, who's on the iPad? Turns out the other learners are on the iPad, the other medical students, but also other members of the team, the case manager, the social worker, or um, uh, physical therapy, anyone else from that team that needs to be on. And I mention this because this hybrid blended rounding system might become part of the future when we think about the new normal. What does that look like? One question, which I think Jeannie's already alluded to, which is, is, you know, what needs to be in person, but what can be done without? And what can you do that would still actually um, keep the element of the patient clinician relationship and so here you've got a medical student presenting the the photo is from the attending point of view um and then the nurse and then um and then the um caregiver and so you're and then the reason it's called leapfrog rounds is when they go to the next room this medical student is going to hop back and go back on the ipad and the next medical student will then join the rounds and so um do i think we'll have a return of large rounding yes but this is already interesting because in the preclinical students who all want to have some experiences with clinicians and shadowing is there a way to bring some of that in with um hybrid rounding and blended learning i don't know but these are the questions that are currently being asked and so um, as I end, I just want to highlight that, uh, you know, I'm just giving you some examples of great work that's being done in our organization by a lot of different people. And um, I've mentioned some of the work around uh, the library service as well as the um, Ignite teams. Um, but I do want to say that our institution has had a lot of value added roles for learners in the health system during the pandemic. And in, in over 100 submissions to the AMA, Accelerating Change in Medical Education Health si Systems, science challenge, University of Chicago had the most number of submissions of any institution, which I'm really proud of, um, speaks to a lot of the ingenuity um, in, in UME and GME that um, and our leaders uh, that are on the line as well as um, supporting. And some of that included the uh, residency COVID unit, hotlines for non-English speakers, um, a telehealth program. Um, I know that John Lowe is on the line and John and Renslow and the team, along with fourth year medical students, led a telemedicine hotline for our students, as well as some of the work that um, um, uh, many of our students were working with um, uh, Lolita al Qureshi and Weiwei Li and Sachin Shah on how to actually deploy education for patients to actually adopt telehealth. And so I don't have time to talk about all of those, but just to say that there is a role 
for all of our learners to be value added roles on our teams. And even right now, we have students that are working with Will Parker and Anna Vollerman and others to help call patients to get vaccines because we know that not every patient is able to see a MyChart um, alert on their phone, for example. And so with that, I just want to give you some closing thoughts, which is that learning during the pandemic poses several challenges for all types of learners. Um, how to balance learning needs at the point of care requires deliberate organizational investments in trust, transparency, and teaming. And I do think value-added roles need to be the wave of the future. Um, and so with that, I will pause and just say I wanted to give a plug for now April. Tomorrow starts uh, April is National Interprofessional Healthcare Month and we'll be celebrating at the University of Chicago and I wanted to draw your attention to tomorrow at noon um, at the Research and Medical Education Conference where we have a really great session um, as well as the Kagashaw Lecture supported by the McLean Center and then uh, National Healthcare Decisions Day April 16th we'll be inviting uh, Judith Baggs who's a nurse scientist to talk about nurse physician collaboration in the ICU and so with that I'll turn it back over to Mark. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, that, that, that was lovely. Um, uh, Anita, uh, are you, can you hear me now? Anita? Uh, yes, I can. I've moved to a different area of the department. If I can um, ask Yolanda to show the slides, I'll just touch upon it, two slides. Uh, so I'll keep every my video off. I won't talk about the ACGME response or the different stages. We never went to stage three, but we did do a lot of shuffling around of yeah. our, our residents. Uh, next, next, uh, next, next. So I wanted to just talk about it, the overall effects on the education. It changed the way we had to, uh, we educated our residents. We had condensed didactics and remote learning. It changed the way we performed rounds and delivered patient care. Vinny's talked a bit about this with the remote huddles and, and smaller rounding groups, but we also moved to a platooning strategy in which we had groups of residents who had time on and time away to limit exposure in their team. We also moved to telemedicine, which has its own challenges in the way learners work with faculty. We had reassignments of medically necessary time-sensitive care, which affected our, our resident learners' exposure to types of patients and certain procedures. There are some of our fellows who were recruited to do independent practice of primary core responsibilities. So it was a way of increasing our workforce for less supervision of those who were trained in their core areas. And it also changed the way we interacted with our teams, how we interacted with our medical students and staff, but also changed the way we focused on our well-being, self-care, and our view of social, social justice in GME. Next slide, and this can be the final slide for me. I have several others, but I really think that we had to ask ourselves, are we maintaining the quality of our education programs? Are we providing the same quality of care to our patients, both in acute care, chronic care, and did we put preventive care at risk during this critical time? And are we negatively impacting teaming in the way we have chosen to run? in small groups. And finally, is the pandemic contrib contributing to burnout? I don't know how much time we have left. I was going to leave the rest of the, my time to talk about how we address some of these issues, but maybe it might be more helpful if we pivot and just have conversation and discussion because we and GME are, and across the institution invested a lot of time in well-being, including having Candace Norcott do small group uh, discussions. We also provided safe spaces for our residents and fellows to discuss challenges that happened with the social injustice that we witnessed around the country as well. So there were a number of things that we did as I still a work in progress, but I would love to just answer questions given the short amount of time we have left. Thanks, Anita. I, I'm going to turn it over to Brian Callender to or, organize the questions. Brian? Yes. Um, Anita, we do, we do go to like 1, 1 30-ish, so if there are additional slides that you would like, like to show, um, um. We, you know, to, to making sure that we, we touch upon right. everything that you wanted to touch upon, you, you certainly have the time to do so. 
Well, Yolanda, uh, if you don't mind just quickly going to our well-being slides, I'll just quickly go through in like five minutes or less one things we did. So if go to slide 11. So this is what we usually do in GME. And you can see we have four big buckets of function. Next slide. We really part it down to just what it kept to keep the ship afloat. So we really wanted to part everything down. And it's interesting, Vinny already talked about trust and transparency, but just focusing on the education on the first column, making sure that our residents were competent to do the tasks they were assigned to, to make sure they felt comfortable in their reassignments of tasks, to make sure we had adequate supervision. And actually, we went to monitoring duty hours every week centrally to make sure that our frontline residents and all residents were not overworked and that the work was distributed evenly. Uh, next slide. Um, we then also talk, thought about how telemedicine really impacts our education mission. Obviously, it's a very different dynamic that we're all still learning. As you can see that some of the programs went to telemedicine right away with their learners and some were slower adapters. Next slide. Uh, we heard a we tried to listen as much as possible to our residents and fellows, what was working, what was not working, and try to address their anxiety. Next slide. And we really already had a number of resident resources that were available in GME. So we tried to supplement these with other additional things that could help. Next slide. Uh, this included uh, making sure our residents knew about the Institutional Disaster Response Program making sure that we address foundational needs. At one point, this sounds really silly, but after I need a toilet paper. Again. So we had to make sure that we address their foundational needs as well. And we even gave them weekly care packages, free weekend meals, and just ways to address some of their basic concerns. Next slide. Um, so, uh, and he's already talked about trust and transparency. Next slide. Um, th this addresses the issue of independent practice, which again, we were taking fellows out of their positions as learners and having them work on the front line to provide direct patient care in the areas that they were already trained. Uh, next slide. So we also had to change the way we onboarded and oriented people. Obviously, it was in the middle of uh, orientation was in June. So we had to shift to virtual platforms, which also impacted how residents were brought into our system and culture. Um, they had concerns as they were moving to cities in which they didn't have the opportunity to visit ahead of time. So things like housing, transportation, and child care, we had to supplement with additional information and just trying to build teams with social distancing. And then the final slide uh, will be a graduation activities obviously were significantly changed and impaired. How we recruited our next team of residents significantly changed. So we really had to do education around all of this. Um, and as Vinny already stated, we are having a new normal and finding a hybrid way of interacting and continuing our education mission. There were some silver linings, like we actually found our participation in remote didactics increased significantly because people didn't have to move to a certain physical space. We also felt found that our participation in graduate medical education meetings doubled because people were able to tune in remotely. So there are certain things that we did that we'll continue to do based on lessons learned, but I think relationship building and really having a full clinical and procedural and educational experience was severely limited. So as we bring in new sets of learners, we have to figure out how to address these deficits that they've had in the last year of the way we have trained and educated our learners. So thanks for your time. Great, so, so thank you very much to all three of you. When we were early in the organization of, of this lecture series, uh, being at an academic medical center, we said, you know, we have to include medical education somehow. 
Um, and then I think the three of you did a wonderful job of sort of explaining the incredible work that had to be done uh, across the sort of medical education spectrum. And so, you know, we can't thank you enough for, for being part of this lecture series, but I think also for all of the work that, 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 that you've done for this institution um, to make sure that, that our learners, again, across the medical education spectrum, we're, we're getting the education they need um, and we're being safe about it, but also addressing issues around uh, burnout and well being. So, but for the sake of time, I'm going to jump into a few of the questions uh, that are in the QA or chat. So, please, people, uh, participants that are out there, uh, submit your questions to the QA and uh, we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Um, so, uh, the, the first one that I see uh, is, is from Joanna Cuppy, and she asks, and I think this is, is more for you, Jeannie, that are you seeing any difference in the clinical preparedness of your rising M4s with the reduction in clinical time in the current M3 year? So that's a, a great question. Um, so just for some context, uh, we had prior uh, four 12-week blocks, so 12 weeks of medicine, 12 weeks of surgery, uh, six weeks each of OB and uh, pediatrics, and then uh, what was referred to as the triplet, which was four weeks of neurology, four weeks of family medicine, and four weeks of psychiatry. Um, using uh, the LCME's guidance and also uh, sort of national benchmarks across the country, we had to make decisions about shortening the clerkship lengths in order to ensure that, number one, the third-year students would be able to finish their clerkships on time and transition into their fourth year, uh, but number two, also to provide a buffer of time at the end of their clerkship year for students who had to defer the step exam because of the sort of catastrophe around Prometric. So we shortened it to eight-week blocks um, and made it such that we had eight weeks each of surgery and medicine, uh, four weeks each of OB and pediatrics, and then a two-week neurology experience uh, paired with two weeks of elective and four weeks of psychiatry. Um, when you compare it to national data in terms of length of clerkships across the country in the AAMC's curriculum inventory, we're actually closer now to the national average than we were before. Um, and in fact, we have several of our peer schools who um, had shortened their, for example, their internal medicine clerkship to uh, four weeks total. Uh, so I think that the students' level of preparation, uh, we have no concerns about what that will look like. We were able to, in that run-in time, in that runway to the clinical clerkships, actually take out all of the uh, didactics and lecture and put that at the front end so that students really, when they're on the wards, they are, they are on the wards. There's very little that will take them off. They don't have to go to a lecture or go to a preceptor. Um, they really got that at the front end. So uh, we don't foresee any um, clinical preparedness issues for our rising m force. Great. Um, a, kind of along a similar sort of lines is one of the lessons of COVID is the current weakness of the U.S. sort of healthcare system, public health, prevention and equity, and the historic model of having a teaching hospital for medical education disproportionately emphasizes subspecialists and procedures to maintain financial survival. Given the gaps between community needs and preventive and primary care services, what strategies need to be undertaken so that vulnerable populations and disparities are actively addressed? And so I think, I mean, this can be for all, all of you, I think, because I, I think it's been mentioned about sort of learners now having more of a social just, justice kind of advocacy focus, um, but also thinking about will students be looking more towards primary care, not just because of this interest, but also because maybe they haven't been able to do subspecialty elective like they normally would in terms of career exploration. So there's a lot to sort of unpack there, but I think it's more about turning medical education at an academic medical center to focus more on primary and preventive care rather than, than subspecialty care. I guess, Jeannie, do you want to start with that and then just go to Anita? And I'm, I'm happy to. I'm happy to sort of try to. I'm reading the. I think it's in the chat, so I'm trying to read yep. all of it, Brian, and process it at the same time. I mean, I do think that you know, obviously, we saw that the, the pandemic was a huge stressor on the the U.S. healthcare system just in general, and that um, I do think that we have seen that you know what happens when the rubber meets the road in terms of public health. I do think that in terms of uh, impact for the students, at least for medical education, I know Vinny can speak to this. We're actually seeing many of our students. Uh, are 
choosing to and are more interested in actually doing basic science research, um, I think given the implications of what's sort of gone on over the last year, so maybe counter to this person's uh, presumption. But I also do think that we're seeing a lot more around the idea of physician advocate. Um, the AAMC is actually releasing new competencies in the next six months about diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, which also include advocacy as a part of this. And so I think that the students have felt and have really demonstrated and role modeled the idea that you know our job, our role as physicians really is to advocate for our patients, whether that is in you know vaccination availability, ensuring that we could still stand up the free clinics for the, the people to have access to care during those timeframes. So I do think we may see a little bit of that transition, at least in, um, we, we are not necessarily very subspecialty focused in our student education, but we do see a lot of that in practice. Um, however, we, we I think if you look at our data from the AAMC, you know, we, we actually graduate many more students into the primary care field than, than really any of our peer schools. So I think that what we've learned is we need to be more nimble to actually meet the needs of the surrounding community. And I feel this specifically in OBGYN because what we learned is there are already few hospitals on the south side of Chicago uh, de delivering obstetric care. And what we learned during the pandemic is even fewer continued uh, to do obstetric care because they had to close their OB units to expand COVID care. So we found that Trinity Hospital um, significantly decreased their obstetric care. Um, Bernard Mitchell, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Bernard also um, decreased their care too. So I think the lesson we learned to stay in tune and focus with the community and the leaders to really address their specific needs as it, they evolved during the pandemic. I think that's a lesson we learned during the surge. I think it's a lesson with, that we continue to learn as we address vaccine hesitancy and the need to have what we've been calling these pop-up vaccine centers. And, and that was what was really great about the Community Champions Program that GME launched is our community champions are working directly in these uh, programs. So working in Roseland, giving vaccines and also um, for the full gamut, giving additional education, but also the service of providing the vaccine. So I think that as an institution, we can embrace our surrounding community better to address the needs as they evolve during the pandemic. Um. And I will just add, um, you know, in addition to what my colleagues have already uh, really highlighted, which is our, you know, uh, commitment to equity, social justice issues, uh, and why people come here to train, for example. Um, you know, I think that um, Michael's question in the chat really gets at payment reform and the U.S. healthcare system and the way in which we've evolved. It's no surprise that other countries that have more public health infrastructure have done better. Um, and I think that um, this really is where the rubber hits the road. Do we have the stomach to do this as a country? And I, if I had to say, I, I would say that, you know, we're still talking about salvaging Obamacare. You know, I mean, that's that's the where the discussion on the Hill is, you know, um, as opposed to where it needs to be going, which is how do we get more uh, people in interested in going into primary care. Um, I will reflect on the match just a little bit in terms of, um, you know, um, we, you know, there, the primary care match in those fields was actually considered robust. I can speak about internal medicine in particular. What people may not realize is that 60%, uh, roughly 60% of of the, the slots are filled by international medical graduates. And so, um, you know, is that important? Well, we gauge how competitive a specialty is often by um, the U.S. does by the interest of U.S. grads. And so the match was was, you know, internal medicine did well um, and, um, you know, so did family and others. But the difference is often made up by global health people coming from other countries to train here um, at the same time that those people face a lot of barriers in training. And so um, so we so when people describe the concerns around um 
spots and, you know, et cetera, and uh, funding, um, one of the things that really does need to be brought to the table is the needs of the of the American healthcare system. And unfortunately, that's sometimes not in the discussion right now. And so I, I think we need to bring that into the discussion. And that's where the advocacy will help, um, is, as Jeannie mentioned, like, how do we bring that into the discussion at the policy level, as opposed to things that are happening in our academic medical center? I, I, just, just a, a question that I have is since you, you you brought up politics a little bit, a lot of this is sort of, sort of political, and just sort of thinking, thinking nationally, were there any sort of differences in how medical schools responded to the pandemic, in part based on whether it was sort of a red state, blue state kind of thing? You know, Brian, no, we didn't really see that. So the, I think the issue, the the differences that we saw were less about politics and just more about the epidemiologic trends in the places that there that there were. So, for example, you know, we have a group of peer schools that we will dialogue with on a regular basis. And in fact, during the heights of the pandemic, we were actually meeting the different groups, curriculum, student affairs, et cetera, on a weekly basis. And there were definitely big differences between, for example, our colleagues you know, at Columbia, we're having a completely different experience than our colleagues at Duke. Um, and so they, the if you looked back and sort of traced back those dashboards uh, through time, I'm sure you could sort of trace the, the waves across the country. So, you know, we were pulling our students off the wards when our colleagues in, in, you know, in North Carolina still had students actively on rotation. So the response was less political and more impacted by epidemiology. I think we all kind of felt the same um, the same pressures of the um, the testing situation. I will say that schools that were um, academic centers, urban focused schools, had a very different experience, I think, than schools that were rural, uh, because there was this perception at the beginning of the pandemic that students that were in more um, urban centers where there were more health systems were going to have opportunities to sort of rotate amongst those hospitals that other students weren't going to have if they were, say, in, you know, Oklahoma or Kansas or South Dakota. Um, and I think the, the AAMC did a really good job of trying to manage all the kinds of the constituents that they have across the country um, and not just the academic medical centers or the community centers or the, the, the rural centers. I actually do think though politics came into play as well though, because in the centers that were under-resourced, I think the pandemic just really accentuated that. And I also think when thing, when we started addressing social uh, injustice, you know, there were some programs that had no diversity officers. They didn't even know how to unpack what was going on. So I do think that there were, uh, I mean, maybe political is the wrong phrase, words to use, but I think that there were different mindsets that did have to be addressed. And if there were already deficits in institutions or in communities, it really worsened uh, those issues. I don't know, Vinny, if you have any anything to add or not. Yeah, no, I think that this conversation um, really reminds me of the need for a more um, focus at the national level around workforce policy. The one thing that I will say that I've been seeing a lot, uh, and this is more from, you know, my work that I've done with ACP and um, and others around um, scope of practice um, and interprofessional is, you know, there are rural areas where, you know, there are no teaching hospitals and there they have very few, for example, um, pulmonary critical care came up as a big issue, right? Um, so during a surge, who is ICU trained that is going to be able to take care of you um, in Southern Illinois? And so the um, the way that the surge happens is the hospitals that fill first um, are going to be the hospitals that are the smaller rural hospitals, and then they spill over to the academic hospitals in the city. And so when people look at Chicago, of course, you know, there were a lot of naysayers like, oh, you guys have beds. But then you look one hour away and you see that in that hospital that's a feeder for us in Indiana or in um in in uh, you know southern Illinois is not is is has no more beds and so um, so that was I think that one of the things that I know and I know that Will Parker has done a lot of work on this is sort of thinking about uh, us not just in isolation and so even as a training ground as a care pa patient care delivery center how do we make sure that we are serving the needs of our region. Um, and I think this is kind of gets at what, um, you know, Anita and the GME team are trying to do right now with community champions, which is really get 
people into the community to think about these things. Um, I think that happens to happen at a national level too. Great. And there are two questions we'll we'll get to in, in the Q and A. So the first one by uh, from Pat Narakis is just sort of medical students. And it's a question about medical students and volunteering. I would say trainees and volunteering as well. That that are there any concern that that trainees may feel obligated to volunteer or sort of opt in to see COVID patients for fear of not being seen as a team player or having it impact evaluations. That's a great question. Um, and so in terms of the um, the the way we manage the issue around COVID patients, um, the students are not required to know. And in fact, we actually went through the Hicks team when we had these conversations, because obviously, uh, as we reincorporated the students onto the clinical wards, we really relied on the guidance from the Hicks team, especially uh, Dr. Landon um, and Ms. Carell and Dr. Weber about how to best manage this. And in fact, it was thought that it was likely going to be um, safer for students to, if they were going to opt in to see COVID patients, that they actually saw COVID positive patients as opposed to PUIs or persons under investigation uh, because of the uh, more rigid adherence to PPE policy with patients who are known COVID positive. Uh, that being said, I think we been very frank and, and honest with the students to say that the expectation was not that they would be um, that they would have to see COVID patients. Uh, we left it to the discretion of the fourth year students uh, who are in sub internships because they will be quite frankly interns who will be responding during a pandemic in a few short months. Um, the clinical experience that students have on any of their rotations, their individual rotation um, are part of the grade, but not their summative grade. And in fact, many of those are now past fail. And so we really did not have a lot of concern about any ramifications of that. Um, and we've seen students, I think, feel relatively comfortable about the messaging. We've also done some large scale messaging to all faculty uh, so that they have a good understanding of how that, you know, how that should play out. I think it's obviously very different from Dr. Blanchard's perspective. Trainees obviously are frontline care providers, and so they sort of have to see COVID patients regardless. Um, but for the students, you know, as long as we had ample PPE and now that students are vaccinated, I think we are seeing a, a higher level of comfort in seeing uh, the COVID positive patients in the, in, in the inpatient setting. And, and, and I guess, Anita, to sort of kick it up a level to the GME level, did you notice any sort of changes or, or how did the sort of the, you know, as Jeannie said, sort of they sort of had to see, see patients. They didn't have sort of the option to sort of um, choose to see patients, but they had to see patients. How, how did that play into sort of their anxiety, but also their, their thoughts about duties, professionalism, um, those obligations? You know, it's interesting because when we had the initial surge, some of the non-medically you know, non necessary time-sensitive services were greatly halted or shifted completely to virtual platforms. So there was a difference in exposure across the residency programs. So especially when they, they were cohorted, so a patient could come in with COVID positive and some other diagnosis, but end up being cared for on a COVID specific unit. So initially there was a, a an imbalance in the way uh, residents and learners were exposed to COVID positive patients. And I think that did create some angst. Um, uh, there were some teams that have volunteer only if you wanted to participate in COVID care. And there were some smaller teams like labor and delivery. If you were assigned to labor and delivery and there was COVID positive patient, obviously you care for them. Um, we actually now have felt a lot more comfortable with everyone taking care of COVID positive patients or PUIs. And I think that that's been an evolution in the system. But uh, what we have found is, you know, in general, our residents will step up to meet the need. And so when they were asked, they really responded in a way that we all felt really proud about. Um, I think ultimately this is part of the general training that all residents who've trained in the, during this era will have experience, which will actually increase um, the strength of their training. However, we found that some areas, especially in the procedure-based specialties, they had decreased exposure, which I think in and itself poses a uh, consideration of how do we make sure that they're prepared to step up and care for patients in the full range and breadth of what their specialties would require. Um, I, I really feel like, you know, everybody really had a team approach. So people felt worried about 
if they were called to take care of COVID um, positive patients, did they have the knowledge and expertise to address it? But fortunately, I think Hicks and the program directors and the education programs really gave the basic information that all residents and fellows needed to feel comfortable with the care. So it wasn't that they didn't want to take care of patients, but they wanted to make sure that they had the knowledge base to do it in the most competent way. Great. And, and for, the, for the sake of time, I'm going to try to combine the last sort of two questions in the, in the Q&A, which I think sort of speak to the idea of sort of what the new normal is. Um, and as sort of with the increase of remote kind of recorded lectures that can be played back for years, as well as the increase of online resources for, for learning medical information, do you think that there will be a shift towards flipped lecture style teaching? Uh, to ensure continuing value of time with instructors. And then I think sort of the follow-up one to that is, is extending that beyond medical education, but thinking about just sort of CME conferences, talks like that. So how, what, what will the new normal look like in terms of CME when it comes to sort of the remote learning environment or the hybrid environment? Yeah, I'll take a take a stab at the flipped classroom. So I mean, I think that it's I think we will obviously see big changes in terms of sort of what is pedagogically appropriate depending upon the topic. I will say though that you know flipping the classroom uh, is not you know technology for technology's sake is not is not an instructional strategy. And so I think that there are definitely some intangibles that we are missing because we are not getting people together in a big group, um, whether that be for lecture or otherwise. Obviously, cohort effect and and classes sort of developing that collegiality, that sort of sense of self. And I think that's something that's really important. Um, I think both on the GME side and the UME side, you know, making sure that uh, people are developing that sense of community amongst each other. I do think from an instructional pro uh, process moving forward, Brian, I think that, you know, Leveraging technology and being able to use the time that we have with students to do so in a way that engages them in self-directed learning, more focus on TBL, TBS learning, problem-based learning type experiences. Um, there are some large group lecture experiences that I do think are valuable that we'll have to think about content and how that is moving forward. Um, but I do think that this will definitely inform kind of what we think um, will be the most necessary, you know, moving forward. I think remote testing and online testing is is the wave of the future. I don't think we'll ever give a paper-based exam again, uh, which I think is completely great. Um, I think remote remote assessment for NBME is fantastic. I think there's been a lot of big wins, um, but I do think that from a pedagogical standpoint, yes, I think lecture is going to be squarely on the sort of chopping block for many institutions. Well, I certainly hope that we don't go too far into the Zoom world. I don't know about you, but I spend like half of my day on Zoom, if not my whole day. So when I'm actually in clinic like this morning, actually seeing patients, touching patients and interacting with them, it's refreshing. So I do feel like there are some intangibles that Jeannie mentioned that I think are part of a whole interactive learning that I think would be lost with the concept of mostly recorded things. I agree with the testing. I agree with some meetings. I'm on two boards and our ACGME RC is now virtual, so it goes and half the time in American Board of OBGYN, our meetings are much faster. But I think the whole ability to interact, to have hands-on learning at the bedside and really to have modeling and mentorship, I think that really takes a relationship that only can be done in person. So while I think recorded lectures are okay, I love the opportunity to actually be able to have a discussion about what we're talking about and not just talking at people. So I hope that part of it is is not lost in the new hybrid. And I will just add um, a different lens, which is um, I was at the meeting for the Council of Medical Subspecialty Societies, which is a coalition of um, specialty societies that put on conferences. And so they are actually struggling with this question that you highlight, Brian, right now, which is what do we do? Plus the, the a nexus of that is travel budgets and the fiscal realities facing academic medical centers. And so I think what we will see is a potential hybrid model. Will we see faculty traveling as much? Will that impact promotion? These are the kinds of discussions that need to be had, especially given, you know, whether somebody saw you in the hall at a conference is an important, meaningful exchange for that, having that person write you a letter or not. Um, and 
the and and also I will say that also is important uh, because this, especially societies also generate a lot of revenue for themselves that way to produce teaching material for the society. And so you can see how when business and education depends on in-person instruction, then you end up with this sort of ethical conundrum. So I don't know what the answer to that is, but given that it's ethics conference, I thought it would be good to end on that. So. No, that's that's great, and and we are at time. I, I don't know. There's one question that maybe it could be a yes. No, was it medical simulation utilized more robustly to supplement the losses the medical students face due to lack of patient contact? So it will be. I mean, during the throes of the pandemic, it was just not possible from the medical school side because the standardized patients. Um, you know, there were people that were not comfortable being standardized patients during the pandemic. We obviously had restrictions with gathering and space and all of those things. Um, I envision that it will be, obviously, and I think moving forward, we'll do my, many more assessments um, using standardized patients as, we, as we're able to liberalize that. I apologize. I'm going to jump off. I'm actually going to be running an elective right now, so yeah, thank you no, all so much. I, we, we are past time, Mark. I'll leave it to you to, 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 to say your final thanks, but thank you, everyone. It was a wonderful panel. I uh, apologize for all the sort of technical glitches, but that that's part of the remote world that we live in. Uh, I, I thought it was fabulous. I, th I thought the three speakers were uh, off the charts. Um, Anita, I'm sorry that you had to put up with that difficulty um, in the middle of your of your, of your original um, uh, comments to us. But um, we'll, we'll look. At it. I, I thought the the meeting was wonderful. Um, Next week will be Angie Wall from Baylor talking on when a scarce resource becomes more scarce, the central role of ethics in managing the impact of COVID-19 on transplantation. Um, so I want to thank everybody, Vinny, Anita, um, Dr. Farnan, um, and we'll see everybody next week. Thank you. And, and Brian, thanks so much. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.